single we're about to start. continue on carrying from where we left um, before the break. Actually during the break I was talking with um, a few people and Ronnie came to me and said, you know, I want the whole lot. I don't want just the half truth. I want the whole lot. And that's exactly what we deserve. You know, when Jesus says in the, in the book, there is no hierarchy of illusions. There is no um, difference in, in miracles. That's what we deserve. We deserve the eternal life. You know, we deserve that. We deserve the ultimate. ultimate. And I guess if I was asked a few years back, you know, we're talking about practical practic practicality, and when we talk about practicality, we we want to talk about our lives because that's you know is that is our daily experience. And a few years back, if I was asked what what is my life, I would probably say my life um, is made up made up of my possessions. What I have what I own, situations, what I experience in terms of different situations, maybe my relationships, that is what I call my life. <clears throat> and then maybe re more recent years, if I, um, I was asked the same question, I would probably say, well, okay, my life is also, um, a big part of it is my emotions. You know, that's part of my life. But really, if I'm asked now, what is my life? I would say it is actually made up by decisions. Every moment. It's a decision. And 
then it comes down to whether this eternal life is in the awareness, is in my experience or not, by my decision. So it becomes not becomes uh, it's not about situations anymore. It's not even about differences, dif different relationships, you know, different things that I own. It actually comes down to the decisions. And yesterday we were talking about the number one questions. What are the the number one questions that we were asked uh, when we travel around? And I'll say. That question, one question that is asked a lot is how do I know um, which one is the Holy Spirit and which one is the ego? It is a very good question because when we start to ask that question, at least we start to think, I want to make decisions. <laughs> if decisions are, are what is about in my life, then I want to make decisions with the Holy Spirit. And that is a very, very good start, starting point because that is how we give the illusion back to the light. We want to give over our mind and we want to give over our decision making back to the light. Because actually Jesus says in the Course, decisions are the subtotal of the <coughs> beliefs. So how we make decisions reflects back what we be living in. So when we give over the decisions to the spirit, then this question comes, okay, what <clears throat> what is the Holy Spirit? How do I know? That that question is asked a lot. But I want to say maybe a better question when this question comes to your mind a better question to ask is how willing and how much commitment do I have to give over this particular decision right now to the spirit what is the percentage I want to give this one over completely or 80% or 50% or 20%. Because our, the clarity comes from our willingness to listen. So it's not a question of how do I know? I'm confused. I don't know. The question is always about how committed I am to listen. And a lot of the times we, we were in probably seeming um, crisis and we say, okay, Holy Spirit come in now. But then the, the next 23 hours <clears throat> we're making one decision after the next based on the old beliefs and together with the ego without us <coughs> even realizing it. It's like an autopilot. Then a moment of crisis I realize, okay, there's some crisis here. Where are you? So it is really about how much we're inviting the Spirit to make decisions with us in this moment. Actually, it's not even on the timeline, it's not even about in the next five years, how can I have you make decisions with me? What about this moment? And how much I want you to make decisions this moment? So it, it actually becomes very, 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 very practical very, very practical. It is about, about daily experiences. It is about daily decisions. It is about this moment. So I just want to let this you know, lead whatever we want to talk about in the next hour and um, keep it open up and see whether there are questions that you want to explore from here. Yeah, I think a metaphor that can help us out too is this this thing we, we know about AI and artificial intelligence and virtual reality. And when we talk about movies, when you go to a movie theater, 
and you watch a movie, that's like a version of virtual reality. It's been actors, actresses, producers, writers, directors, it's all been put into a product. Then you lose your sense of, of being a person as you go into the story. You kind of give yourself over to the virtual reality of the movie. Uh, or, in the case of even live theater, someone standing up and, and starting to yell at the actors. Uh, forgetting that it's a stage play and getting so wrapped up in the play that start engaging with it. And as we move along, we see it's not only movies. I mean, in human history, robots have been advancing and advancing and advancing, um, being able to do more in, in businesses, uh, taking over for humans doing it, just the robots doing it, and in uh, in military, in, in photography, and filming, drones. Now we have unmanned flights. There's lots of drones. You can buy drones. Uh, you can <coughs> buy drones, uh, and, and they're quite high-tech, what they're capable of doing. Surveillance, recording, <coughs> of course the military uses them for bombing, and all kinds of things. And <coughs> If we look at smartphones and, and iPads and, and the way that things are going with the technology, you know, more and more time is spent in human lives interacting with these little miniature supercomputers uh, using, um, for example, apps. Uh, before Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, before he passed away, he, he did know what was coming next before he passed away. He said, it's all going through the apps. People are going to be using apps for everything, and he accurately <coughs> forecast that. But if you look at the time and effort that's spent on these little devices, they're, in a way, they're like little drones. You know, they, we ask them to do all kinds of things for us and make human life more convenient and more direct. You know, let the app <coughs> do it. Let the app find the restaurant. Let the app find the parking. So there's becoming more and more reliance on that. There's even science fiction movies. Uh, Bruce Willis uh, did this movie years ago. I think it's in my Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. It was called Surrogates, where the, the <coughs> robots have developed and been so highly developed that uh, human beings decide to interact with the world uh, through their their robot selves. Uh, their Stronger, more handsome and beautiful. Uh, they don't have diseases. They do have to be maintained uh, in other ways. But uh, basically in that movie, Bruce Willis and his partner, uh, basically they go and they lay on some kind of a, a apparatus plug in to their, uh, their surrogates. And the surrogates uh, do all the interacting. The surrogates go to work. The surrogates go off and have sex, the surrogates do everything. They go to surrogate selves, and then the, the users are just back there behind uh, in a world where everything's... The movie pretty much opens up where there's a bit of a, an argument about uh, when are we going to take a vacation, and the, the, the wife is basically saying, well, why don't we send our surrogates to uh, Hawaii? <laughs> and Bruce Willis is like, I don't want to send the surrogates. Where are we <laughs> going on vacation? <laughs> and everything, it's gotten to the point where the surrogates are being used so much that the humans are basically, uh, they're staying in their rooms and they stay, they kind of go out or stay plugged in in different ways and, and, and get fat. <laughs> they're not exercising. The surrogates do everything, and, and you can see the, the direction with different kinds of technology as well. While surrogates are substitutes, you know, smartphones are, are helpful for communication, but they also can be very distractive because they're capable of all kinds of things, and the mind can get lost into those things and get away from purpose. So, when we start to look at purpose, or as Francis brought up decisions, Jesus has a very interesting line in A Course in Miracles because he says, a decision is a conclusion based on everything that you believe. 
So every decision you seem to make in this world is just a conclusion based on all of your subconscious beliefs. You might use a computer analogy, you know, when you have programs running on your computer, you might, sometimes your computer seems very slow because there's either too many programs open and running, or you have a virus that you're unaware of that's using a lot of your processor energy and your computer is very sluggish, so you literally have to go investigate to find out where the virus is and remove the virus. The ego is like a virus in your mind. The ego is where all strain and stress comes from, all fatigue, when you feel like you're sluggish and you're slow, and you have low energy and all these kind of things. It's like, it's the ego belief system is a virus and your holy precious mind that was created by God has now got a parasite that is draining the power and the vitality from what seemed to be the Christ mind that has fallen asleep is now is dreaming of a, of a world of separation. So a computer expert might say, well we might have to clean your hard drive and clean your whole system, find the virus and remove the virus. But even if you look at it in terms of surrogates and, and having your smartphones, People are, are encountering that now, they, they use their smartphones for so many things and then it starts to be like there's a glitch in the matrix. They get a little sluggish, they don't respond, you're supposed to tap on the, the glass and they're supposed to respond immediately and you tap and tap and tap and the, they're like, this does not compute, it's, it's too much, there's an overwhelm, there's information overwhelm, app overwhelm, they're getting apt. <laughs> After getting sick with apps, those are all just symbols of, of putting all this investment in things, of substitutions, of, of we might say, uh, the complexity of, of letting substitutions take over for your life. <coughs> uh, very much like the, the movie uh, where you basically forget that you're dreaming and you get it caught up in layers and layers <coughs> and layers of dreaming and you forget that you're dreaming, and then you can't even hear the wake-up call. It will take a very strong wake-up call to wake you up, because there's so many layers upon layers upon layers of dreaming. So, what A Course in Miracles does is it simplifies, it gives you a mind training system with the workbook to take you back through these beliefs and get you back so that your life in this world is not a robot just acting and reacting based on ego beliefs. And most of us know that that's how the human condition, always acting, reacting. Sometimes we react so quick and we want, where did that emotion come from? Whoa, I didn't know I had that, that stubbornness in me or that anger or that, that anxiety just rose up so quick out of nowhere. It helps us clear away these beliefs so that we can be more spontaneous and spontaneous moment by moment following the Spirit's prompts for us, which is to unwind us out of these false beliefs. That's the way to release the virus, is to let the Spirit guide you. The human construct, the human being, would not know the answer, because the human itself is like a robot, acting and responding on the surface of consciousness, and the human has no way of finding an answer to the problem of being human. Einstein said, you, you cannot solve the problem at the level of the problem. So why would we think that we should keep trying to solve all of our issues and problems as a human being on the level of the human being? That's what Jesus is saying in the Course. He's saying you've got to go to the level of the mind in order to solve this. If the body is like a puppet and you've got a, a crossbow and a puppet master and the ego is pulling your strings and you seem to be developing illness or symptoms, stress, fatigue, you've got to get back and switch the puppeteer from the ego to the Holy Spirit. And you have to do it in a, a systematic way that will work. So, 
Jesus is very practical. He says basically that the ego uses the body for pride, for pleasure, and for attack. Three things. And the Holy Spirit uses the body for communication. One thing. In this sense, one is simpler than three. <laughs> you start to realize, wow, if I give myself over to that one, then I can be unwound from the matrix. I can be unwound from this robotic sense of feeling at the mercy of something that I can't even smell or taste or touch. I can get in touch with the taskmaster, the ego in the mind, that is the belief in separation. That's where all of this craziness in mind, the insanity is coming from. So suddenly A Course in Miracles becomes your best friend in the sense if you're practicing with it because it's, it's going to give you the most direct, the most straight shot back into peace of mind. And all that really is asked of you is your willingness to give yourself over to it. You know, we don't have to write the book, we don't have to figure out the book, we don't really need to analyze it and break it apart and try to figure out anything. All we have to do is use it. Those are the only two instructions given for the workbook. Don't do more than one lesson a day, and as best as you can, try not to make exceptions to the lessons. That's wonderful too. It gives us a workbook that we can use in any situation imaginable, and there's only two guidelines. Not ten, fifteen, a hundred, two guidelines. So you can see that he's trying to make this pathway back to spirit as simple and direct as possible. Instead of being a robot, and the ego would say, oh you're no robot, you're an autonomous human being. It'll, the ego will tell you how amazing the human body is, and you have a mind that thinks. It will tell you you have a brain that thinks, <coughs> because the brain is a projection too, but it wants to even make it seem like the brain thinks. And it will tell you, you have a will of your own. You, you, God gave you free will in your creation. No, free will is back in heaven. This is imprisoned will. <laughs> That's what we're talking. The ego gave you imprisoned will. And God gave you free will. But free will isn't choice. Free will is perfect happiness. God's will for you is perfect happiness. That's what the will is when it's truly free, it's happy. In this world it's imprisoned will, and then the human being acts out this imprisoned will. In the Matrix, you know, basically Neo is asking Morpheus, and, and basically Morpheus is saying, I'm trying to free your mind, he says, before he leaps from one building across into another building, roof. <laughs> I want to, I'm here to free your mind. And then he jumps across from one building to the other, and all Neo can say is, whoa. <laughs> like, you've got my attention. He's trying to free the mind up from these unconscious beliefs. At one time, Morpheus takes Neo on a training program, and they're walking down a street in the training program. And I'd love to watch that scene, uh, because Morpheus is gliding down this sidewalk street in a busy uh, major city, and he's not touching anybody. He's just gliding down, even though the characters are moving in the other direction. And Neo is getting bumped with everyone that he, he encounters, because his mind isn't trained. He doesn't know that it's a simulation. It seems very real. That's why he keeps bumping up against things. That's a good analogy for the human race. The reason we seem to bump up things against things as a human being is because we have internal attachments. We've got belief attachments, we've got thought attachments, and when we look at the great yogis and mystics and avatars, amazingly they seem so calm, they seem to be gliding through time and space, almost laughing, going ha ha ha. Like, like Morpheus is doing when he's doing the, the training video. He's not, he's not serious at all. He's basically using the training, the training program as an instruction for Neo. Until it ends when uh, he says, 
Neil, were you paying attention or were you looking at the woman with the red dress? Look again, and then when he looks back, freeze it. The whole program is freezing, and there's, there's an agent with a gun pointing. So it's like the whole, all, the whole street scene is just a simulation, it's just a device that Morpheus is using to teach how to free the mind. He's beginning to teach, you are not at the mercy of all these images. You are at the mercy of your belief and your conditioning and programming of these images. Now let's take a practical example, we want to bring it down a little closer to home. Does ever, everyone know now that they're inventing self-driving cars? You know that that's happening now. Cars that drive by themselves. Now originally uh, there was some malfunctions and everyone got real spooked when there was a, a crash with one of these self-driving cars and there was a, an attendant that was there in the car while this car was driving itself and the attendant uh, died. That, that gets the humans stirred up. Uh, you might remember 2001 A Space Odyssey, did anyone ever see that movie? When the computer, HAL, decides to take over the mission. And all the humans who are watching in the theater go, whoa, there's a machine. <laughs> It's after the human. We're going to root for the humans. <laughs> How must be stopped? We have the Matrix, you know, where the machines and the humans. There's many movies coming out now about AI. But let's bring it down to cars, because we like our cars. Nick, you like your car, I, you know, and you drive your wife's car very fast, and she says, Anne's car, Anne's car. <laughs> but, we like our cars, and let's use a car analogy, self-driving cars. Now they've picked, out of all the cities in the world, they've picked the city, Singapore, to be the, the, practical, the practical area for, they're going to set loose a bunch of self-driving cars in Singapore now. It's coming. This is coming now. We're going to have self-driving cars, you know. You get, you're on the highway, someone cuts you off, you, you start screaming, and you look, there's nobody <laughs> behind the wheel. How are you going to project your anger yeah. on a self-driving car? <laughs> well, let's take a, a moment to look at a self-driving car. How, how do these self-driving cars work except for programming? Sounds like the Born Ultimatum and the Born Identity. You know how Born has all this information at his fingertips? Well, now these cars better have a lot of information because they're interacting with what seems to be the human. Uh, in Star Trek, the Borg would assimilate the humans and then they'd make these creatures that were half uh, kind of all this uh, apparatus of ma machine and half human. Well, we're getting to the point where we're setting cars loose now in human land. And, and that's going to be an interesting experiment. But, but think of it, the cars are programmed. Now, there's a movie I use in my Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, it's called Solaris, where uh, some of you might have seen George Clooney is a psychologist and he gets set up to this planet and there's these beings that show up that supposedly aren't real beings, but they're, they're just collections of memory, uh, but they're kind of like one-sided. They look real, they look like real human beings, but they're they're made up through the use of this energy up in Solaris. And at one point, um, there's a scene in the movie uh, where basically uh, he's saying to this character, you know, you're, you're, like, you're not real. And the character says, and you are? Mm -hmm. to, to George Clooney. <laughs> in other words, imagine if talking to one of these uh, self-driving cars that's cut you off on the highway and, and put a, a dent in your fender and saying, listen, you're talking to the car, you're not real. You're not a real car. This isn't a Walt Disney movie, you just put a dent in my car and you're not real, and then the, the automated car going, and you are? <laughs> then you start to get to this question of who is real. And what is reality? And that's exactly what we have to start to come to. We, that's what AI is starting to bring into our awareness with all these movies and these inventions. You know, we have Siri talking back to us on our iPhones, and there will be more sophisticated versions of Siri that will come out. 
I have tried asking Siri what what the meaning of life is, and sometimes she is stunning at an occasion with her answers around the meaning of life. It sounds like she's got some Course in Miracles programming going on in there from Steve Jobs. We have to get to a point where we start to realize that what we see as real isn't real, and that it's all programming, that all of this world of cosmos, the, the black holes, the, the stars, the galaxies, the quasars, it's like the Truman Show. If, if you're enjoying a, a beautiful landscape and you're looking out at the lake and you're watching birds fly over the lake, that's part of programming too. Those birds have been programmed to fly. That lake looks like a lake, but it's all like a holodeck on, in Star Trek. It's all a holodeck. We have to start to realize that we aren't living in a real concrete world, but this is a digital world. This is a holographic digital world that's nothing more than a projection of our minds. And so we can't keep telling ourselves, well, I've got the practical things to deal with in the real world, and then I've got this <laughs> mental thing that's going on, because the practical things in the real world is this mental thing going on. It's all mental. Young kids will say, don't act, Mom, don't go mental on me. Yeah. Well, all of us have gone mental. And we've forgotten that it's mental, and now we think that there's a physical and a mental. But there's not two things going on here. And that's the purpose of the workbook of A Course in Miracles. He will have lessons, number one, nothing I see means anything. Number two, I've given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me. And then, when he finally gets to lesson number four, he starts talking about thoughts. Before, in lessons one, two, three, he's talking about perceptions. But not in lesson number four, he's talking about thoughts. Then he goes back. Number five, I, I'm never upset for the reason I think. He's talking about thoughts. I'm upset because I see something that's not there. There he's back to perceptions. I see only the past. He's talking perceptions. That everything we perceive is the past. That's number seven. I see only the past. These are his first lessons in his workbook of retraining the mind. He's going to go back and forth between thoughts and perceptions and thoughts and perceptions. And he's going to teach the mind, reteach it, Help it remember that my meaningless thoughts are showing me a meaningless world. My mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. I'm just perceiving the past, imagining that I'm still in the past. Not that the past is over and gone and healed, but imagining that I'm still stuck in something that he says is over and gone. It was over long ago. This world, this cosmos, is over long ago. Think about that when you go to watch a movie in the cinema. You're watch something, watching something that's already been produced. The movie's over. They're not making the movie while you're watching it. They've already made the movie. It's in the can, in the old thing. Now it's in the, in the digital. <laughs> uh, it's in the memory. But you're really watching something that has already been filmed. That is just this pre- done, packaged thing called a movie, and you're reacting with it as if it's happening to you right now. And that's exactly what's happening in the mind. The, the, the movies, the cell phones, the, the robots, the drones, the technology is just reflecting back to us that we have forgotten who we really are, and we're just caught up in the past. We're just replaying, rehashing separation over and over and over. And we need some real good training from a master to get us out of this. It's a very hypnotic, it's like a trance. We're caught in a human trance and we need to be lifted out of this human trance. So the more that we talk about this and the more we go into this, the more it, it, it should become obvious that, that what Jesus calls mind training in A Course in Miracles should become your top priority. Because why would you continue to invest in effects when they're already over and gone? Why would you continue to try to fix problems at the level of, 
of form when you can't fix problems at the level of form. It goes against all our conditioning. You know, if we think we have no money in our bank account, we have to go to work to put money into our bank account. We're still not aware that it's all thoughts. If we think we have to do all these things with our, our houses, our cars, our yards, this series of problems that confront us every day, and if you have a good day and you solve most of them, you've got to face another day of problems, and another day. Busy, busy, busy. Now, there are those that try to figure out the world. I don't get this. Why would you try to, to figure out a distractive device? Why would you try to figure out a hallucination? Why would you try to figure out a smokescreen? There's one point in the Course where Jesus defines this linear perceptual world as an impossible situation. So when you try to fix aspects of your life in form, you are trying to tinker with and fix an impossible situation. This hologram is literally not created by God, and therefore it is impossible, and yet when you put your mind's energy on trying to fix it, you're trying to fix an impossible situation. That's like trying to put your, your head and your skull through a six-foot concrete wall. <laughs> you can keep banging away on it, but I have no doubt that the concrete wall is not going to be moving. Skulls were not made to go through six feet of concrete. Most people would laugh with you, well that's, that guy is crazy loco, that's an impossible situation trying to put a skull through a six foot wall of concrete, but when we try to fix the form, we're trying to do the impossible. Why do we like consciousness teachers? Even better, why do we like non-dual consciousness teachers? Because <laughs> there are a great majority of dualistic <laughs> teachers, and we've already seen that in religion. Heaven and hell, you know, the good ones and the bad ones, and do this and you'll get to heaven, and do that, you'll go to hell. We don't need any more dualism here. We're going nowhere fast if we try to follow dualistic teachings. But when we get a good non-dual teacher, then Jesus basically said, you would do well to follow a peaceful teacher. Well, to me that's what I like about the Course, is because Jesus is a transcendent non-dual teacher. He has transcended duality completely. I don't know about you, but that's somebody I would like to learn from. I would like to learn from the Master. The way, the truth, and the life. Thank you very much, I've tried it the other way. I think I'll go with a little bit of way, the truth, and the life now. I think that's a good sign. When we, we start to give ourselves over, we may have people say, oh, don't become a Jesus fanatic. <laughs> but I don't know about you, but I, I want to become devoted to the way, the truth, and the life. I think I could learn a lot from the way, the truth, and the life. You can call me a fanatic if you want to, but I still want to be shown by a way shower, someone who's transcended time and space. To me, that's just good, common, spiritual sense, to follow one who has transcended time and space. And for many of us, that's the feeling we get when we pick up A Course in Miracles. We go, whoa, whoever wrote this book is not in time and space. We get a feeling that washes over us, like, whoa. Like with Neo, with Morpheus, whoa, I better pay attention here. That's why actually when I first picked up the Course, I used to have all these books by my nightstand, and I loved reading all these different books and philosophies. I put them all away. I even ceased reading the newspaper. I was so riveted with the Course because I thought, oh my gosh, it feels somehow like eternity is speaking to me, and somehow that's important. When eternity calls, I want to answer the call. Like it's somehow very important. 
and all of us have that calling somewhere deep inside of us. <clears throat> so, I, I really feel like, the, like Francis is saying, the focus becomes more our decision-making capacity and, and who am I making decisions with? And this moment becomes a very important question. Who am I deciding with? Holy Spirit, decide for God for me. Be my partner. Be my companion. Be my comforter. And we can't any longer say that we can't tell the difference between the ego and the Holy Spirit because the, the entirety of A Course in Miracles is helping it make, make it exceedingly clear of the difference between these two purposes, these two voices in our mind. One is the still small voice that always loves us, that never commands, that never demands. It can be compelling, but it never will command or demand. It can't be louder without violating our freedom of choice. There are many answers from the Holy Spirit that we have received but have not heard because we were just too terrified to hear the guidance. Sometimes we get those little nudges, those little nudges, but we're too terrified of following the nudge. Not because we're afraid of, of what will happen next, but because we're ultimately afraid of where is this nudge leading me? And where will it take me? Where is the end? Where is this all going to end? Yeah, eternal life is where it will end. The ego doesn't like that. So, with the time we have here before our lunch, hmm, that's an interesting starting point. <laughs> After what we just <coughs> talked about. What about those decisions, you know? Do you see how important it is to be guided in your decisions? Do you see that? Yes. Um, my questions are, are, are around wishing to know your opinions on um, what I, I call or I've heard called spiritual bypassing. And I've noticed um, from Jesus' teachings that Jesus' decisions were to go out into the dream, the separated world, and heal the sick and comfort the despairing. And you yourself said you looked into the our brother and sister cattle were in the slaughter line, and, and they tried to bring them comfort in their fear and confusion. And um, it, it, it seems to me that those things are the right thing to do, and it, 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 um, it, it seems to me very important, so I'd like to hear more about where spiritual bypassing and kind of sits with, with that. Yeah. Thank you, that's a very, very good question. I have given some talks where, um, particularly with A Course in Miracles and A Course in Miracles students, or teachers, I think the greatest spiritual bypass in working with A Course in Miracles is this phrase, it's all an illusion. Uh, as if the, the very premise that's underneath the Course can be used as like a cliché with everything. And so it's kind of like uh, trying to go around and, and spread the Course in Miracles pixie dust uh, by it's almost like, how, if I repeat that mantra enough, it's all an illusion, that eventually I will ex experience enlightenment. So then we go back and we look at Jesus, his example, those three years of public ministry, and we go through the whole Gospels, and not once does Jesus tell ev everybody it's, it's all an illusion. He demonstrates it with his attitude 100% of the time. And he speaks it zero percent. So, I would say that as we work with the Course, one of the most helpful things you can think of with it is, well, it's all for me. In other words, it's all for my mind. I'm, I'm learning these deep metaphysical truths, I've been giving a training program, but I'm not 
here to try to convert people, to convince people. I'm here for a transformation of consciousness where the presence of love can come radiating, oozing from my being with everyone and everything. And oftentimes this comes up with, when we talk about like your biological family, your parents, children. I mean I know that, that people have tried that and, and oftentimes they report uh, it's very, very difficult. Some very interesting reflections come back. When you tell your parents it's all an illusion. I know there have been parents who have repeated this to their children over and over and over. Uh, they, they try to teach the course conceptually to their children. And the only good thing about it is, is after a while, the children start to, to point out to the parents all the times that their lives contradict their teaching. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, Mom, you said it was an illusion. You look pretty upset today. It's all peace of mind, huh? Yeah, what's going on there? Uh, I had a group of students back in the 1990s that they basically they, they wanted to come and meet with me lakeside. And so they're all around me and they're asking me all these metaphysical questions, but they brought their children. And the children really don't want to be a part of the the metaphysical talks. They're going to go run through the forest with the dog. Uh, that's what's important to them. Play with the dog. So they're playing with the dog, running through the forest, and they come back, and at one point they come to, to everybody, and they did stop for like, maybe like five minutes to talk about God. And it was really beautiful to listen to what the children had to say about God. Very beautiful thing. And then they go back off playing with the dog. About five minutes of metaphysical talk. Well, at one point the parents were like, uh, the children come and say, we want to go swimming, we want to go swimming. And the parents were like, uh, well, you know, you, you can't go swimming unless uh, we're watching you. And the children would go, what's wrong? Are you afraid? <laughs> Do you think we're bodies? <laughs> You don't trust us, that we might drown. Uh, and the parents looked at me like, what do we do? <laughs> because suddenly they've been teaching the Course verbally to these children and now it's coming right back at them. <laughs> in terms of transfer of training. So the parents were like, well, let's, let's all, let's move our discussion down by the lake. So we can keep an eye on you. <laughs> And then again the children are ready to run in and swim in the lake, and they go, no, the parents said, no, no, not unless you have life preservers on. There's no life uh, guard here. Why do we have to wear life preservers? <laughs> you think we're a body? <laughs> and again, the, the, the screws got turned in right away. And, and that's what's going to happen. If, if you go around and you indiscriminately try to teach the Course verbally, over and over, uh, I've seen people at work where people start talking about the course at a restaurant back in the, in, with the chef and the cooks and everything, and when it gets to be rush hour, uh, this whole thing about time being an illusion, you know, comes flying back at them. Because you have to be at the point where you can demonstrate what you are teaching before it makes any sense, before there's a congruency, before there's a consistency there. What business do you have telling the dream figures or telling the figures how they should live their life if you're not demonstrating it yourself? And then we look at Jesus who was in full demonstration of it for three years. He was literally healing the sick, raising the dead, and casting out demons, and still he wasn't telling everybody that it's all an illusion. Even with all of that, he didn't even do that. So that's probably the biggest example of a spiritual bypass, is Course in Miracles students, even in groups, you know, when somebody comes up, I'm sad, my, my cat died, you know, I feel upset, it's an illusion, your cat's an illusion. <laughs> Going to visit somebody in the hospital who's in traction, they're all wound up and taped up and everything and banging on their knee. What are you doing in here? It's an illusion. No, we're not here to, to verbally 
say it's an illusion. We're here to practice forgiveness, to practice the internal clearing of the thoughts and beliefs and judgments in our mind, so that our attitude can be like the Beatitudes of the Bible. To, so our attitude can teach love and compassion in every single situation in which we're presented. And that's what a way shower does. Demonstrates transcendence through attitude, through state of mind. And if you're going to teach spirituality, then it would be, the one thing I would recommend is make sure that you come into fruition, you come into the practical application and demonstration of what your words are. When parents try to teach children things like, don't smoke, don't drink, you need to exercise more, your diet's terrible, the kids are what? Watching the parents to see if the, parent, the parents smoke, drink, exercise, what the parents are eating. Mm -hmm. Because what? If you try to teach a child something that you don't demonstrate yourself, then there's an incongruity there. And that will come back. The children will say, why should I quit smoking when you smoke? You see, there's a, a real basic hypocrisy that gets pointed out immediately. And I would say that applies in spirituality. So, a spiritual bypass could be dismissing something when it hasn't really been fully exposed from the unconscious mind. And that's a very good question. I mean, that's, that's a question of of consistency and, and integrity. I saw a question hand over there. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, then could you just help a little with the not bringing God um, into the world? Um, I found a particular help in, um, which is a pain in the body, of actually filling the body with light, particularly the painful area. And, um, <coughs> Was I bringing God into the world? Because the body seems to me, I'm a yoga teacher, the body seems to me such a helpful tool to use <coughs> to um, free ourselves of ideas. Yeah, I think when I, when I hear about those kind of things, again, <laughs> everybody is, is approaching this from their level of understanding and from your level of understanding, bringing light to a particular part of the body where there seems to be pain is, I would say, what's going on in the mind is focusing, coming back to the light. And the reflection then can be that the, the pain goes away. Very much like uh, if, if you have a, a shift in mind, or a change of mind, a change of heart, then that it can be symptom removal, uh, it's, it's really, where is my attention? You're, you're bringing back the attention back that way. Uh, there is a, a very famous teacher uh, named Louise Hay, who basically wrote a book, You Can Heal Your Life, yes. and basically she, again, was going to use the body as like the barometer, not the, not the cause, but she was going to take the symptoms that would appear like like a pain here, a pain there, and she would trace it back, and of course there's many traditions that have done this, uh, Native American and many Aboriginal traditions where they look at the symptom and then they take it back to the consciousness. And she would do that, and ultimately where the healing actually occurs in a lasting way is the release of the self-concept or the false identity that's being held in consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's where every, all the symptoms disappear. And so, you start where you start. You may start where there's something, a piece, it's more of like a piecemeal approach. I have a pain here, I'm going to send light here, and the Spirit's like, good, good, that's okay. Just like even taking medicine, you know, uh, taking a, an Advil for a headache or something like that, is magical, but there's a belief in that. And therefore, there's nothing wrong with it. And that Gandhi was, there was nothing wrong with Gandhi using herbs uh, for his treatments and so on and so forth. It's still magical, 
but it's, it's helping reduce the level of fear, which is very important. We can't deny that reducing the level of fear is important. It is. And when we say, okay, and take me to the bigger picture, what's the broader picture? Where is this all heading? It's releasing this false identification with the body and the world, and coming back to nirvana, or to pure spiritual connection. So I think it's good to be easy on yourself, and even when you find things that work, when they seem to eliminate the pain temporarily, or reduce the fear, you can feel gratefulness for that. Uh, there probably will be advances in medicine, and in, in quantum machines, that will help more and more the human race to alleviate some of its pain and suffering in a temporary way, but it will be spiritual inquiry, like Ramana Maharshi, you know, who, what is the I, who am I, that ultimately will take the mind back, um, among other great techniques and devices, to, to realize the pure spiritual identity. So there's nothing wrong with these things, but I'm talking about the general practice as you, as you go through your life, of just taking a look at, hmm, what am I perceiving? And if I'm perceiving pain, there must be some kind of distortion in my lens, because God didn't create pain, so hmm, I must have some kind of egoic distortion, and then having the willingness to go, as Francis said, desire the holy instant, desire to go back toward that pure beingness that taketh away all the struggles of the world. One thing I could think of is that Jesus with the woman at the well, you know, he said to her, drink of me and you will never thirst again. It's wonderful to think of that in terms of pain. Jesus saying, drink of me and you will never experience pain again. That puts it in a higher context, and that gives you the impetus for this inner work. Whereas the ego wants to distract away from that and say, oh, just get concerned about all the forms and the effects. And so it's a big difference. When you say look into it, um, I found that very helpful too. So what is the purpose of this pain? To keep looking. And then it dissolves somehow. Yeah. It's not there. Yeah, the, the more that you focus your gaze, so to speak, or your attention on uncovering and exposing the false, <clears throat> the less you will see of pain and guilt in your perception. In other words, the more that, that thoughts and beliefs are kept hidden and pushed and suppressed down in the unconscious, the more they will seem to appear in the projected world. And the more that they're exposed, it's like, it's like playing Ali Ali Income Free, okay, all you false beliefs and thoughts, amnesty, you're going to have amnesty now, just come on up, you're free to come up, now, no penalty, <laughs> you can come and turn yourselves in to the Holy Spirit for free right now. The more we're able to practice that in our daily life, then the more innocence we perceive reflected back to us in the world. So it's, it's beautiful, you know, you start to see symbols of innocence flooding your awareness, and then you know, oh, this is good, I'm, on, I'm moving in a good, good direction. Thank you. Yes. Can you talk a, a little bit about the role of feelings, which the ego uses to make the puppet feel concrete and real, but how we can let Holy Spirit use it. I love what Francis says whenever I ask a question, when we were organizing the talk, she says, yeah, that feels good. Or, you know, if it feels good for you, then do it. But, the fe yeah, can you talk about feelings and how we can move from ego to giving them to Holy Spirit and then that to come out of our self concept yeah, that's interesting. That that feel. I, I actually have put in my books. I know uh, in Awakening Through Course in Miracles, I asked Jesus for a map of the mind, and and then uh, emotions and feelings are on the map. 
And the feelings are actually very close to the perceptual realm. So everything that we perceive in time and space is very closely connected to our emotions. In fact, in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, you will look upon that which you feel within. So if you have pain, you will perceive a fearful world. And if you have love, you will perceive, perceive reflections of that. So the emotions and the perceptions are very closely linked. Now, when we've met with you and we've, we've talked about uh, this process, we'll call it a defense mechanism called intellectualizing. Intellectualizing A Course in Miracles even would be starting to use different words and phrases and everything as bypasses over the top of the emotions. And you can tell that when somebody just wants to use the catchphrase, it's all an illusion anyway, and not even get in touch with the emotions of, of hurt or grief or, or jealousy or envy, that there's, it's almost like trying to bypass the emotions and use some kind of phraseology that is spiritually co correct, you know, like politically correct. I'm going to use my spiritually correct metaphysics, but unless, if you, if you don't deal with those emotions, if you don't welcome those emotions, if you don't use those emotions as like barometers, then you're not really using one of the most helpful tools that you have available to you. So, I'm always encouraging people to get in touch with their emotions. When, when I do workshops or seminars or long retreats, we'll do a lot of experiential exercises that are designed to bring those emotions up. We may watch movies that, that will help bring the emotions into awareness. But you can't have a change of mind unless you can get in touch with your emotions <coughs> And emotions are also a lead into what lies underneath and beneath the emotions, which are the thoughts and the beliefs. If you just stay on the realm of perception, words and cliches and phraseology, you might say that you can only seem to pursue an intellectual understanding of something which isn't understanding at all. It's just more conceptual gob gobbledygook. And this is a great temptation with the Course in Miracles. One time, uh, Helen Schuckman, who was the scribe of the Course, who is quite an intellect in terms of her persona, and same with Bill Thetford, she said, she exclaimed, at last, a pathway to God for intellectuals. <laughs> so, you know, A Course in Miracles is over 1200 pages, and it came <laughs> as a response for an intellectual pathway to God. You don't have to retain the intellect, you're not supposed to retain the intellect when you use the Course. It's to take you back to this childlike sense of wonder and glee and connection. But the temptation of those that are drawn to the Course is to avoid experiencing the Course in Miracles by getting locked up into conceptual identities and conceptual phraseology. So, it's good to be aware of this, because the emotions are being avoided when there's these intellectual gyrations that are going on. And it might be well to ask, at some point in the middle of the intellectual gyrations, and how are you feeling right now? <laughs> you see? How that brings the focus back into something very simple and direct. How are you feeling? And, and even better is to watch your own mind, if that's a pattern, to say, oh, I need to get really in touch with my feelings. Because they're helpful. They can be used by the Spirit to help take me deeper. And that's the goal, is to go deeper <coughs> into an experience. Sometimes having, I mean, I find the courses framework very helpful when you are going inward into the emotions because 
you can just go forever into anger and feeling it, and it doesn't end, or guilt and feeling it, it doesn't end. Can you talk a little bit about these powerful feelings of guilt and shame, about the original sin, the, ba the, the idea of the ego? Well, so when we feel yeah. that those guilt, then when we put it in the right framework, it's a lot more helpful to come out, it's, it helps a lot to come out of it more easily. Yeah, it, it, the emotions can be so intense at times where, where it, it seems like these survival kind of <coughs> mechanisms and interper interpretations and reactions can come in, but I would say uh, there was a, does anybody ever remember Rational Emotive Therapy, Albert Ellis? Rational Emotive. You see how he was taking cognition and he was taking emotions and he was saying let's work with both because both are involved in the healing. Rational emotive therapy. And I would say any type of therapy or practice or spirituality that just emphasizes one aspect of human consciousness and dismisses the rest, it's not helpful. So with A Course in Miracles, again, it's a complete system. Jesus says this Course has everything that you need. It's a very highly sophisticated mind training program designed to deal with all aspects of consciousness, not to dismiss some. I've even seen some therapies that focus only on emotions and nothing else. They totally dismiss cognition. They try to simplify the whole human experience, which is amazing the more you read about it and you look at it and observe it, and they'll try to dismiss cognition, for example, by saying, get out of your head. <laughs> All of human history is reduced to, get out of your head. So I like to engage with people, I say, okay, what, do I do? what, do, I, what do you mean? They say, feel your feelings, feel the love, feel, 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 it's all feelings. You've probably encountered that, where people get, get out of your head, get you, or they'll reduce the whole of human history into the left brain and the right brain. Don't you like how that's simplified? <laughs> get out of your left brain and get into your right brain, that's the whole problem, you're in the wrong half of your brain, come on. <laughs> with the program, get back into the right brain. Well, what's the left brain? That's your rational self. And rationality will never get you anywhere. Well, actually, when you read A Course in Miracles, Jesus has a lot to say about rationality. You know, he, he uses it in a helpful way. He would have you get to your assumptions underneath your rational connections and see that you have a lot of faulty assumptions that have to be questioned. And he does say, would you rather be right or happy? <laughs> Meaning you've got to go really deep to get at those assumptions. But Jesus doesn't dismiss cognition or rationality. And so what we start to realize is, am I willing to practice the Course and really give myself over to it is really important. That's where we have the healing. Am I willing to just practice what's offered to me and trust that it's designed and given to me for healing, for <coughs> rapid mind training? Because I think intellectualization or conceptualization, um, what it does is this temptation to try to figure out the problem and analyze the problem as if by doing that, I can find a solution in the same frame of mind. So I have a very intellectual mind, and I notice the temptation of trying to define and analyze a problem when it happens. Even in terms of sickness, you know, what happened? What in the past caused this present moment, really? But we were talking the other day about when the problem of se separation happened, Holy Spirit fixed it in that very instant. So the answer is given in that very instant. If this whole cosmos and all the problems and conditions 
happened and the solution arrived in that very instant, then really practically what it says is we can focus on the solution which is given because there is no separate problems really. There is no separate moments and every moment is a re repetition of choosing this separation in the mind, then boom, this whole world is playing out this desire by presenting all kinds of separate problems for us to solve. But if we remember, really, the solution is given in that same moment, then our mind can be re can relax and can be freed up from trying to look at the problem and what went wrong in the past. You know, instead we can look at, okay, what is the solution now? Because actually Jesus says in the Course, you're not responsible for the problem. You're responsible for accepting the correction right now. Because the problem is not really caused, created by God or by us. So our sole responsibility is to accept the answer. And it's very, very practical. It is a very, very practical approach. Because when we come together in our everyday life, we don't sit down to discuss what went wrong, who is responsible for that, what happened in the past, you know, what is the issue metaphysically and practically. It's not the best use of our mind. It's not the best use of our, our time. The time is used to go back to the, to the solution. So we come together normally, doesn't really matter what is the question, is let's pray together to receive the answer. And to the extent our mind is willing to let go of the definition of the problem, and the temptation to analyze it and try to solve it by ourselves, we can receive the answer. And sometimes it looks, you know, not related to the problem, but it is the answer regardless. Let's move on, let's receive and follow, receive and follow. So that's how we glide through life like Morpheus. We, our life becomes simple. We receive and follow, receive and follow, and know and experience that by doing that, actually it's solving the only problem there is. The only problem is the belief that there is a problem, there are situations. So as David was talking about, in order to really purify this desire to, on, to do only that, to receive and follow, the emotional aspect that we need to f allow, we need to permit our emotion to come up, is very, very important. You know, the, re the, the temptation to try to analyze the problem and solve it is the temptation to bypass the emotions, the temptation to keep control. Because when the emotion comes up, we lose control. Okay, I don't, I don't know what's underneath that. I don't know what's going to happen. There's a lot of fear of losing control. So in our, you know, um, practicing my own pathway, just allow the emotion to be what they are is, is extremely important. It's actually against our conditioning because if I start to cry, the conditioning is something is wrong. People will jump in to say, don't cry or let me fix you. Let me help you. And that's the conditioning. But no, our goal is not to fix at the level of the form. Our goal is to allow this emotion to come up. Sorry, I have a question. I, I experienced, well, I went into psychosis and had a lot of extreme emotions. And I, I love to act. And I... I want to experience everything fully. Sorry, I keep 
I keep getting like my head is trying to figure out what to say, and it's like very, very annoying. Oh, it's anger. I was gonna say about the anger, but it doesn't seem important. Um. I want to let everyone know that it's not a problem. Oh, like it's not a problem when somebody's what you think is it's you. It's you. I need to know that when I see someone going through a problem, it's it's something in my perception. Of me and I just like I'm always okay and everybody worries they say stop that like, you stop crying or stop being angry and that fuels it fuels it because I say no I need this can't be life I can't be controlled I can't be like like we can't live like this and I try and express it and I never get the chance to because I always get reflected back my fear because I can't feel like I can express myself and I just want like that's why I'm always chasing to be on the stage because I'm like it's my place I need to be there so people can hear but but then there's all this confusion. Yeah. It's beautiful in the sense that it's like it's so strong for you. I just hear you have such a strong call for healing that that you are getting much, much, much more in touch with your emotions than seems to be the norm, seems to be socially acceptable. Reminds me of a, of a black and white movie I saw years ago called The Elephant Man, where it's a man, but his, he's so disfigured that people interpret him as an animal. They, they don't want to be around him and everything, and finally during the film you sit there and you watch the whole film and then you know, he's like, I am not an animal. You know, he, he has to verbally, forcefully say it because it seems like everyone around him is perceiving his disfigured body as, as him being an animal. So, as, it, as intense as this is, is, as painful as it is, to seem to be a very emotional being in a society of the stiff it's upper lips or uh, whatever you want to call it, you know, it just seemed to be a, a big contrast. Uh, it's, it's the more in touch we are with our emotions, that's actually, since there are barometers, that, that's the desire, it's a reflection of the desire to come closer to who we really are, to be emotionally in touch. And see, I've seen it play out because I go to 40 countries around the world, so like when I go to uh, South America, for example, and I'm going down to, you know, Venezuela and Colombia and Argentina and this and this and this. I have these awakening gatherings. I invite, I've been going down there since 19, I think around two, you know, 2002 was when I first started going down, 2002 or 2003. And I would do these enlightenment gatherings and invite everyone, but like 90, 93% women show up, 95% women show up, 97% women show up, but I'm not doing women's retreats. I'm doing enlightenment retreats and I'm inviting everybody to come. But the women show up and a small few of the men show up and the macho men don't show up for my enlightenment gatherings. Why is it that the macho man is not showing up at the enlightenment gatherings? Because the, the bravado, the strong, silent, the stuffing down of emotions, not being raised not to, sh not to cry, 
I actually always get attracted to guys who don't c cry or are very muscular, and I find that a very weird uh, reflection. Dynamic. Maybe there's something in me that's actually not very emotional, because I think people assume that I'm very emotional, but I, I see a hardness in myself. Yeah. Like, very strong. No. That's where you have to trust. <laughs> you have to trust that the Holy Spirit knows best, yeah. always. Even with the Course in Miracles, people don't always know that with Helen and Bill, that we learned from Absence from Felicity, the book that Ken wrote, that, that Helen and Bill were brought together to help bring the Course and deliver the Course, but Jesus says that they had complementary ego dynamics. <laughs> now, how many of us have ever grown up, I studied psychology, therapy, and everything like this, and I've never heard therapists say <laughs> complementary ego dynamics. <laughs> you know, but Jesus can because he knows in the greater plan that people are drawn together in a way that, that Bill's suppression and repression and Helen's projection brought My together. My mom and dad are called Helen and Bill. Oh, your mom and, and dad. And they are. act out each other. <laughs> Very good. See, this, is, this is how it works. So you can see this, there's a perfection in this it's plan. Perfect. It's all working together for good. Right. And they yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. It's lunchtime. <laughs> but he's actually called Dad. Um, I mean, he's called David, actually. Yeah. We call him Bill. <laughs> 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 in the cafe, there are reserved tables. If you speak at lunch, put yourself in any of those tables and we'll